Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Peter. I'm an alcoholic. How you doing? Jesus. <laughs> Very grateful to be alive and sober at a meeting. And uh, once again, thank the group and Mike for uh, this kind invitation of having me down here the past uh, four weeks. Um, this is uh, certainly going to um, be one of the bright spots of my life. Uh, this has been an absolute joy. And uh, I really have all of you guys to thank for that, uh, for making this uh, easy for me, uh, for embracing what I had to say and embracing me when I walked in the door. And um, I've always shared this whenever I walk into a room uh, of AA, an AA meeting, uh, I'm treated with nothing less than dignity, love and respect. And uh, you guys have shown that week after week I've been coming here. And uh, that's one of the great things about Alcoholics Anonymous. I've gone to meetings uh, in many, many places and always have been welcomed. And uh, so I thank you uh, for that uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, made this uh, really a joy for me. Um, we're supposed to talk, I'm supposed to talk about 10, 11, and 12 tonight. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to share a, a, a quick ninth step amends story um, before I get into our talk. Uh, I talk about 10, 11, and 12. Um, Sometimes I share how uh, God has a sense of humor, but uh, I uh, going through this work the second time uh, and trying to stay current. I, I have realized the value of being current. Where am I now? Uh, what am I doing now? What new experiences am I seeking and am I having? Uh, it's been uh, I have found vital to uh, me being a recovered alcoholic. But uh, I uh, was going through this work, and uh, a woman's name came up on this list that I needed to go see. And uh, it was one of those um, names on a list that you just, no, nah, I'm not going to go. I'll, I'll, I'm not going to do this. This I shouldn't do this. And a lot of shoulds not to and uh, not listening to the quiet voice to go do this. And uh, so I speak to my sponsor and he says, you really need to go take care of this. And uh, so I sit in prayer meditation because I have no clue where this woman is. And I get the, the idea, look through some old phone books. And uh, about the third phone book I went through, I find her phone number. And I make a call to her. I took a shot. No one answered. Second phone call, she answered. And uh, she knew who I was right away. I don't know if that was good or bad. Uh, but uh, I explained to her why I was making this phone call. And um, this was right after, by the way, I was in um, uh, Sunset Park, Brooklyn. I just finished giving a talk. And uh, I made this phone call. And so I shared why I was, make, why I was making this approach and, and the harms I was clear on. And I had asked, is anything you need to tell me? And uh, what can I do to make this right? And she asked me uh, if she, if I can give her some money. And I asked her how much she would need, and she told me. And uh, so I agreed to meet with her. So I just leave a meeting. I'm going to make an approach and clear up the wreckage of my past. All good so far. Um, and she tells me where she lives. And it was a part of Sheep's Bay, Brooklyn, that I was sort of familiar with. And it turned out to be a sordid spot. And uh, I asked if she would meet me downstairs because I didn't want to go into the home or anything, and she agreed, and she was downstairs, and she's standing outside with a pit bull, so uh, I says, what did I do? You know? uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, I pull up, and I make a prayer, and I, I turn to my God, and I ask him for some strength and direction again, and I get out of the car, and uh, once again, I kind of reiterate why I was there, and uh, sadly, she didn't look too healthy, and um, in a very delicate way, I suggested places she can go to, to get some help, and how truly sorry I was for the damage I had caused. And uh, I gave her the money she requested. I wished her well. I got back in my car. And on my way to my car, I kind of felt like, um, I hear this expression a lot, like drop the rock. A lot of that boulder was kind of off my shoulders. I felt lighter and a lot more cleansed and free and that I did the right thing. And I took care of business, wreckage of my past, another piece put away. And I got my car and I thank God again. And I started to drive away. And <clears throat> I noticed the police pulled out of the projects and followed me. And uh, I didn't think much about it, 
uh, I made sure I had my seatbelt on. That was being a good citizen. I threw that right across my shoulders. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? So, uh, <clears throat> and um, so I, I come up to the light, and I, and I make a left, and they make a left too. And um, I come up to the next light, and I make a right, and they made a right, and uh, their lights went on. And I'm saying, okay, I didn't run any red lights, and I'm clean and sober, so what's the deal? Anyway, they get out of the car, and um, they says, what are you doing here? And I, I give us your license and registration. So they saw my address, which is Staten Island, and um, they says, you live in Staten Island, and you're here? And I says, officer, here's the deal. Uh, um, I thought I was going to go to jail. Um, I says, he says, what are you doing here? And I says, okay, what do I do? Tell him the truth. I says, officer, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I just finished speaking at a meeting in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. He says, hold it. You live in Staten Island, you're in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and now you're in Sheepshead Bay. I says, yeah. He says, what are you doing here? I says, part of what I do, how I live, is cleaning up wreckage of my past. I'm here to clean up some business. I, I, I damaged someone a long time ago, and I'm really trying to do the right thing. That's why I'm here, and I'm on my way home. He said, get out of the car. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> so now I'm saying, I'm, I know, I'm, I'm getting pinched, and I'm going to jail, and... Uh, I had my medallion. As I got out, my medallion happened to fall out of my shirt, and I says, "Look, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm now I'm step away from begging." And uh, I says, "Officer, I'm, I'm really here." He says, "You copping drugs?" I says, "I don't do drugs. Uh, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous over over 14 years, and this is and again I told him why I was there and where I just came from and." Um, he asked me to roll up my sleeves. Uh, he lifted up my pant legs. He, he basically rolled me, and the other cop started to take apart my car, basically. So I tell him, with a little bit of arrogance, to be quite honest with you, you can take the tires off, you can do everything. I says, I don't do that stuff. Anyway, the, the good part was they were playing good cop and bad cop. One cop radioed to a van that turned the corner, and that's when I really thought I was going to get handcuffed and, and gone for the night. And I said, there goes my job, and what's my family going to think? And uh, I wanted to call up Mark and says, boy, you really said any lens, is this it? Um, and uh, by the way, when I told Mark the story, he just laughed at me. Um, but uh, when they radioed in, I, I really thought that was the call for me to get arrested. And what I did was, um, like I do with all my affairs, is I just turned away or turned in and, and talk to my God and says, whatever's going to happen, I, I'm in your care here. Um, you know why I was here, and I know why I was here. The other cop was taking apart my car, and this big cop who was there pulled me aside, I want to talk to you. And uh, he says, um, I was trying to explain the ninth step to them. And he called me aside, <laughs> and I, I had told him, I says, listen, there's a meeting called the Marine Park Group, Saturday at 3 o'clock. I sometimes go there. There's a Sheepshead Bay Group. There's the Gerritsen Beach Group. That's the only reason why you're going to see me down in this neighborhood. In fact, I've sponsored many guys on the job. I'm pleading here. And uh, so he pulls me aside and he says, is this that immense thing? Uh, I says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so he says, yeah, a few guys on a job did it to me. Just sit here, uh, stay tight and don't say anything. So the other guy comes around. And he said, I don't want to see your neighbor. And they, they wrapped it up pretty much. And I went to shake their hands, and they reluctantly shook mine. And um, I went about my business, got in my car. Now, prior to that, my wife said to me, I told her what I was going to do. She says, can you stop at L&B Pizza? It's a famous place for pizza, not too far from there, George, pizza. And uh, so after this was over, I'm driving home. I pick up my cell phone, which is I found out I shouldn't be doing that either. But uh, And I call up my wife, and I says, listen, I'm really not in the mood for pizza tonight. <laughs> I am in the mood to throw up right now. And uh, and that was one of my Any Lens stories on, on making amends. And uh, it's one of those that, you know, I get to share, and I can laugh about it. But while that was happening, I wasn't too sure uh, what was happening to me that night. And uh, so I'm grateful that it worked out okay. Since it's been over, um, it truly is another piece of my life put back in its place, and I'm not wearing my past. Uh, little by slowly, I've been able to get freer and freer of my past, not walk around and have to worry about who I'm going to walk into, who I'm going to see on the street, 
When is the phone going to ring? Uh, I get free of my past. And the freer I get of my past, the more I can be present here. I, my life, for the most part, is not full of yesterdays and later ons. For the most part, I'm here present now because of seeking current experience and seeking my God and doing what I'm supposed to be doing a day at a time. And it's been proven to me many times, many, many times, that God's always doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Because based on my track record and what I'm capable of doing, there is no way I would make the phone call to this woman to clean up some things that were a little delicate to talk about. But that's what God allowed me to do, to give her her respect and so I can get free. So this, this, this is some of the great things that have happened um, to me, among many others going through the work this time. Um, I'll say this to someone who's new and maybe just starting this work. Maybe a sponsor told you to go home and read the book, or maybe just writing out one of, one of the steps, or maybe just entering a, a house cleaning with inventory. Um, and I know for me it looks like what an order I can't go through with it, and how am I ever going to do it, and I can't be like these other people. I'm, I'm new and I'm just starting out. Um, you have just stepped on to a road of freedom. Our book talks about tapping an unsuspected inner resource. What you do is have made contact with a God of your understanding, and it may be a group of drunks right now, but what's to come, there will really be many bright spots in your life. If you're new and you got that white knuckle sobriety, but you just started to do some work with the sponsor who's awake, not walking around asleep thinking they're awake, is not delusional, but doing some work, you have just stepped onto a road of freedom. And I know when I was sitting there and I would hear people talk about this, I'd say, yeah, but you don't understand what it's like for me. I do. I, I going to read something out of, um, because I was afraid I was going to forget it from um, Pass It On, but Bill talks about Ebby, that Ebby knew the way into this cave because he was an alcoholic like Bill and was able to grab him by the hand and walk him out confidently while other people, the non-alcoholics, had to watch. That's what we do here. So if you're with the sponsor, and if you're not, you ought to get one who's awake. You've just stepped onto a road to freedom. Rather than the road, I always share when I picked up a drink that was paved right to hell. This is great stuff. You, you don't know it, and maybe you, don't, you, you, maybe you haven't experienced it yet, but you will experience your God. It's happening now. And you'll look back six months from now and say, my God, those days were so precious. When I was counting days and my sponsors told me, go home and write, go home and read. Very, very precious moments. Don't overlook it. I wish I could just tell you what it's going to look like, but I don't. That's God's job. My home group is the Free Spirit Group. Um, we meet Monday, Wednesday, and Thursdays. Um, and we just started a new meeting there and open a big book speaker meeting. And we have some people in here who are kind enough to come down and speak. And I'm excited about my home group as to what's going on there. Uh, we are, little by slowly, thanks to the speakers and some group members, putting out a solution for those who care to have it. Um, God gave me a sober date of June 23rd, 1988. And uh, I'm here tonight as a recovered alcoholic. And that's great news uh, to me when I heard that as one who suffered from untreated alcoholism, that I didn't have to suffer from the obsession and the compulsion, that the spiritual malady could be overcome and I can get free. Because for me, when I put down a drink, I, I, I shared about this a few weeks ago. I, I sober uh, June 23rd, 1988 and December 22nd, 1988, I was completely out of my mind. No step work, showing up at meetings, white knuckle sobriety angry, restless, irritable, and discontented, and driven by fear. Fear still owned me, and I was separated from alcohol. Then God put a teacher in my life, and I start to experience some things little by slow, and I start to wake up a little bit. And I was brought to my home group, the Free Spirit Group, and I prayed for a teacher to be put in my life a sponsor. And he was. Why would God deny me that? Why would God deny a new person? Why would God deny any one of us to get someone to bring us to him? So if you don't have a sponsor, say, my God, who do I who do I ask? Ask God first. Who put that man or woman in your life? I can tell you that because I have experienced that twice in my life. Great teachers have been put in my life. Sponsors, besides the other members in Alcoholics Anonymous, little by slowly, God kept showing up. I, I always said that if I had to pick on my own friends or a sponsor, I'd get someone as sick as me or worse. That's been my track record. But we turn to our Heavenly Father and say, please, show me where to go, what to do. We ask for the right thought or action. He provides. Again, why wouldn't me? I have a loving and caring God. I'm sure you do also. And if you don't know it yet, you will find that out. 
I'm, I'm shown this love and care by this God many, many times, not only in the charities that go on outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, and sometimes with people who are non-AA, but right in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, our book says that uh, helping others is the foundation stone of our recovery. Meeting breaks up, watch a drunk standing with a drunk in a parking lot for an hour, inviting a drunk into the house, giving up their little, so, you know, socializing or pleasures to go spend time with the drunk on the phone or in person. Maybe after this meeting, you see someone in the parking lot, half hour, an hour, and inviting that person to go read the book and help. That's why I see God's love all the time in an AA meeting. Great things, great events will come to pass for me and you. And that's one of them, working with others. We talked about, um, or we went through uh, our first step. We talked about the obsession to alcohol and the allergy and the spiritual malady, which qualifies me for a real, to be a real alcoholic. Um, getting into car crashes, and I got into a few almost fatal ones, um, doesn't qualify me for Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, um, going into rehab, making three or four or five rehabs may not qualify me to be a real alcoholic. I mean, maybe I got caught, and I had to go away to get the heat off, like my first few rehabs. Obsession, compulsion, the phenomenon of craving, our doctor's opinion breaks down so much better than I can ever share with you, and the spiritual malady. That's what makes me a real alcoholic of our type in this class. The phenomenon of craving, it always intensifies, never satisfies when I'm drinking. Those things separate me from the hard drinkers and the social drinkers, you know. My brothers uh, drink. Sometimes they get fired up really good but they show up for life the next day. I have no clue where I'm going to wind up when I pick up a drink, and that's the truth. And God forbid, when I was out there, um, I didn't even know when I was going to pick up. It just suddenly showed up and sounded good to me, so let's go. And at the end, I had to drink or I would become violently ill. I would get really sick at the end, and I still couldn't stop. <laughs> my second step was the solution to this, that a God of my understanding was going to restore me to sanity, wholeness of mind, where I was no longer buying the lie, the thought of a drink was removed, therefore there was no compulsion because the spirit was awakened, and I had to make a decision to get to that solution, and that what step three was about. My sponsor was in the life-saving business, not the killing business, he didn't tell me have a good third step before you move on to four, he didn't tell me things like, well, you got a lot of stuff going on in your life right now, so don't do the fourth step, you know, get your life together, then we'll put pen to paper. He didn't tell me things like that. After my third step decision, he showed me next, and we moved through our columns. And really, by God's grace, because I had to pray to God to write this fourth step, I finished that and sat down with my sponsor in five, and I got some instructions for six and seven. And uh, my list was from my fourth step, and there were some names that were added to it. And that, another thing, you know, you get your list, um, there may be more to come. Certain things are revealed to us when they're supposed to be revealed to us, to me. And then as we go along, we start to get away. God says, okay, here's some more. And then we go out and do that stuff. It's about constantly cleaning up the wreckage of my past because that stuff will come back and bite me. It'll kill me. And how it'll kill me, it'll take me away from here and I'll pick up a drink. Our book talks about resentment. Um, I think they use the words uh, fatal. Resentments are fatal. Not only to me. that We know that. Well, what about the people who are suffering along while we're in a place of resentment? When I'm driven by fear, how many people do I step on until I get free of that fear? When I'm living in a resentment, how many people do I step on when I'm in that place of resentment? Usually it's family first, people closest to us. And so I was adding names to my list as I went along and uh, made my approaches in nine. And uh, as we clean up the past, <clears throat> excuse me, a book says something very profound for me. It says we've entered the world of the spirit. I've been awakened by this time. Enter the world of the spirit. It doesn't tell me now kick back and rest on your laurels. You did enough work, Pete. You're done. It says next that I was supposed to continue, continue to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Continue next vigor. Words like this our book uses all the time. So what am I going to do about growing and understanding and effectiveness? What is that about? There's a lot of, there's an awful lot of disciplines that I need for my God in order to stay awake. Step 10 says continue to take personal inventory when we're wrong, promptly admitted it. Now, I'll share this, and I, I don't want to, you know, get on a soapbox here, but I've heard very strange wor ways of work, work in this 10 step. Um, I was brought up in this thing to write. 
I do a lot of writing. People tell me sometimes I'm crazy. I overwrite. I'd rather overwrite and get free than not to write and be sick. But I've heard many people say, well, I'm in a resentment. I just turn to God and I go about my life. And that's great. But who are you discussing with? It says we discuss this with someone. How at once we turn to God, we discuss it with someone and we see who we can be helpful to. So my thing was, if you're not discussing it with someone, how do you know God's talking to you? You may be delusional thinking you're listening to God. <laughs> and then you're going to be sponsoring someone and giving them your delusional thoughts. The way I was brought up in this is pen and goes to, goes to paper all the time. Now, if I break a shoelace and I get free of that, so be it. I turn to God first for everything. But what about the thing that's nagging me? What am I going to do about that? I've heard people share, well, I stop off in the, if I'm in a supermarket and I, and I get angry, I turn to the person online and share my inventory with them. And I'm thinking, how dare you? How dare you represent Alcoholics Anonymous in that light, first of all? And how dare you dump your day on some poor innocent person? Back in the fifth step, it talks about whether a minister or a priest that we share our inventory with, someone who may understand what we're doing. And by the time we get, I get to step 10, shouldn't I be in a good enough place with my God that if there's no one to talk to, I can wait till later on and then talk to someone that I'm awakened enough that I can rely on my God until I sit down with my sponsor or someone who's going to understand. That's the way I was brought up in here, and that's what I do. I put pen to paper. There's some questions they ask us to consider in our 10 step. And I answer those questions when I write my columns with my inventory. I write when I have an opportunity throughout the day. When I look at step 10, I'm really reviewing steps 4 through 9, aren't I? I have a list. I'm discussing it with someone. I'm looking at my fourth column, which are really my defects that are getting in the way. In fact, if, if, ideal situation, if I was to erase all my fourth column stuff, I probably wouldn't have a second column because I wouldn't be angry with that person. What am I going to do about that when it does arise? I put pen to paper. I have experiences during the day when I'm working, and my job is not to steal from my employer and, and tell my boss, I have to write, so you have to excuse me. I'm not supposed to be doing that. Well, what about when I'm on lunch and something is disturbing me at 9 a.m.? Do I wait till 11 o'clock at night to write? I don't. That's what I do. When I have an opportunity, I put pen to paper and write. After I turn to my God, okay, Father, direct my thoughts. Here's what's going on with me pen to paper, and then I'll ring up someone and say, here's get some time for inventory. We'll call up my sponsor, and this is what's going on. I'll share something. I was up, I had the opportunity to go to uh, uh, Cornell University of all places. They send me to Cornell University to interview students. Um, I look at what these kids are doing with their lives in, in college, and I'm, I'm blown away by it, because I think of where I was at their age. And uh, you know, I was feeling intimidated showing up at an Ivy League school to in, uh, interview these kids in, in this very uh, prominent university. And I show up. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, so I'm, I'm there Tuesday, and I'm starting to get a little bit overwhelmed about what's going to take place on Wednesday and uh, have to meet some of the faculty. And uh, here comes fear. Now, book says fear ought to be classed with stealing. What am I going to do about fear? I have no resentment with fear, but I still, I'm still putting it on paper. And um, so I turn and I make some prayer. I made some prayer time and uh, got some meditation time. And I wrote out my inventory. And then what I did was I call up my sponsor. He called me back and we sat down and we discussed my inventory. <clears throat> One of the words they use in, in, in our book is um, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Whenever I put pen to paper, I watch me across paper. And I realize that some of the hours I've squandered in a resentment or fear were futile. For what? Because when I put pen to paper and I see myself going across paper and I discuss it with someone, it doesn't seem so, so, insignificant, so significant. Or at least I can get some good feedback on how to move through this. <clears throat> I was shown with 10-step inventories. Uh, this is one of the tools I was given. Um, Sometimes I'm going to attend um, uh, a party or a family function, and I got fear kicking up already, and I'm, and I'm out there. I'm not in the moment. I'm out there. When that used to happen, uh, very often I would get to the place, um, fear would start running the show. I say inappropriate things, talk when I'm supposed to be quiet, be quiet when I'm supposed to be talking, and I'd really be in a shell and not have the freedom to pack into the mainstream. 
And then I was told, well, why don't you take a look, after making some prayer, why don't you take a look at what's going on with you on paper before you get to this place? I would go to a family function and say, well, Uncle Joe's going to get drunk again, and I know he's going to ruin the party, and I'm going to place a resentment with this guy, and I didn't even get there yet. Do I show up in a place of resentment and then try to pack into the mainstream? I could never pull it off. And so what some of the things I do is put pen to paper before I get to a place. I'm able to get free during my day when I'm putting pen to paper. Another experience I've had is it says about seeing where we can be helpful in our 10 step. I've written inventory on a person I was, was resentful at and found, my, found myself being helpful to them, asking them how I can be helpful because I was able to get free of whatever was plaguing me about that person. I started my, my current job uh, about two years ago, and there was a gentleman on the job uh, who was giving me what I thought was a very difficult time for my first day. And uh, I started to become intimidated by him. I would see him, and I'd I, I start to stutter. Um, Ivy League graduate, and I never went to college. Um, he knew the business really well, and I was the new kid on the block. And you know what I was able to do? Turn to God, write inventory, and ask him how I can be helpful. I was able to walk shoulder to shoulder with this guy with a little bit of dignity. Well, he and I were up at Cornell for the past couple of days. And I have a working relationship with this guy compared to a place of being in total fear whenever he would show up. I'm no longer intimidated by him. I'm certainly not arrogant about it. But I'm able to stand shoulder to shoulder with someone. I see what's plaguing me. Self shows up over and over and over again. My mind gets attached to things like, I'm less than, I'm better than. My mind gets attached to pride. My mind gets attached to ego. The voices start going on in my head. You know, chatter of a thousand voices, each one having, having its own agenda, pulling me in 18 different directions. And you know what they are? They're magnets. They're magnets for me to hear things that are not good for me so I can get attached to and then believe them and they become part of my belief system and I can't even get out of bed in the morning when that happens. It happens that fast. Inventory has erased a lot of that. Turning to God has erased a lot of that. That's how free do you want to get? Or do I walk around blocked? You know, the wedge that, that had to be ripped out so I can stand... One, with my God, with nothing between us, is dying to get back in there and block me once again. Alcohol is a subtle foe. If I rest on my, my laurels, I'm headed for trouble. Our book is really clear about that. Very strong warnings. So I've heard people say, well, <clears throat> sitting with a guy the other night, and he said, well, I don't write that often. Um, I turn it over. Um, boy, do I have a problem with that saying. Um, I turn it over. I don't really write unless something's really bothering me. And my question was, well, how do you know if you're getting free? Are you convincing yourself you don't need to write? Is the illness convincing you you don't need to write? How do you know when you're in the illness or not? If I'm not sitting down and say, listen, I need to talk about some inventory with you. A book tells me every day is a day I must carry the vision of God's will to all my activities. If I am blocked, I'm going to have a really hard time doing that. You know why? Because I'm full of self. And I need to be rid of self. Rid of self in order to be part of the pack into the mainstream, in order to be free. If I'm not writing inventory, my experience has been, and I'm not turning to my God, if I'm not discussing it with someone, and if, not, if I'm not trying to be helpful to others, I'm blocked. And how helpful can I be to someone if I am blocked? Inventory is one of the ways I stay free. Step 10 talks about being restored to sanity, which is a great promise, because Step 10, where um, sanity has been returned, in Step 2, they're talking about being restored to sanity. We make a decision in 3, take some action in 4 through 9. Step 10 tells me sanity has been restored. I'm no longer, and this I share from my own experience, obsessing on alcohol. I've been able to go through some joys, real joys, in Alcoholics Anonymous, right in here and out there. Not once did my mind say, let's celebrate and pick up a drink about this. You know, you've arrived. I've gone through some things that really weren't pleasant at all. And not once did my mind say, we need to escape and get away and let's go drink because this place don't work. Some of the things that I've able to uh, get some courage to overcome from a loving God and staying clear on, on what I'm doing, uh, I'll, I'll share with you. <clears throat> 
I was a longshoreman for 23 years, and uh, I, I lose my job. I have a house. I'm trying to maintain normal expenses and um, trying to be a husband to my uh, to my wife. And I saw my, my savings account bleed to death in front of me. And there was nothing left, and I, and I couldn't get work. And um, I was really wondering what's going on. There were sometimes sleepless nights. And my sponsor at the time had me do some financial inventory and see where I was with my God. And I did lots of inventory and started to get free. But still, my financial situation was getting worse. And I turned to God one day after doing a whole bunch of inventory and, and, and getting off the phone with my sponsor. And I says, I, I don't even know what you have for me anymore. Just save me from me again. And there were some different words that I used, but that was pretty much what I said. Save me from me. Show me what to do. I don't know what to do anymore. God put eight people in my life, and I was sponsoring eight people. And I don't know where they came from or how I was capable of doing it, but I had eight newcomers who never been through this book before coming to my house, call me on the phone, and I walked these guys through this work. I was out there looking for work and inquiring. But to, to get me out of my own way, God put these people in my life. I was not consumed with self. I was giving away. And I kept writing inventory and turning to God, discussing with someone. The, the door was uh, being knocked on. My phone was ringing. The del- doorbell was ringing. And there were newcomers. Eight people at one time. Now, maybe some of, some of you guys out there, that's not a big deal. To work with eight new people at, at, in one shot was a lot for me. <laughs> I I got gray hair to show you later. (laughs) Um, I didn't know what was going on at the time. I just know I was giving myself to others with all I can, like like I always do, and continuing to write inventory. And some of those guys drifted off after a while. But coming out on the other side, and I was back with a new job, I saw once again how when I thought God was not there, again, walked me through this stuff. If I was not clear, I could never hear. And I found in this discipline, there's a whole lot of freedom. And before, you know, I continue and get into our 11th step, um, <clears throat> someone I heard in, in Minnesota give a talk one time, and he said something like, we need to go in, turn into our God in order to go out. Because if we don't go in, we can't go out. But if we go in too long, we better look out. And uh, what he meant, what he meant by that was, Sometimes we can get into worshiping the methodology of what we're doing and become so tight with it. And we never let the Spirit move. We never let the Spirit move us. Why didn't dot this I or cross this T so I'm doing it wrong? It's about getting right with God and letting the Spirit move us and getting free. A friend of mine said he was in meditation one time. And he's sitting in meditation, and he hears his wife calling him from upstairs, and she's calling him to help him, help him with something. And she kept calling, but he was in meditation, and he yelled out something like, God damn it, I'm meditating, leave me alone. <laughs> and he told me as soon as he said that, he realized what he was doing. You know, I heard a gentleman say that we can 11-step ourselves right out of Alcoholics Anonymous. We think we're worshiping our God, and we're following directions, that all we really are is full of self. Again, I've experienced that. I've gotten so tight on rules and regulations and had had to dedicate so much time to prayer and meditation, and I don't want to minimize that time. It's precious. I do a lot of prayer, and I do a lot of meditation. I do a lot of writing. But what am I doing after that? Am I in a state of obsession like I have to help my wife and she's taken away from my prayer time, or am I helping her? I mean, many times I get up really early in the morning. Sometimes my wife is up early also. If she's walking with a basket of laundry, do I say, well, you're on, you're on your own because i got to go pray now? That's not what I do. That's not what we're supposed to do. The spiritual life is not a theory we have to live in. What am I doing? How am I helping others? Prayer meditation, um, I've had, I've been, I really feel blessed to have had some really neat experiences in meditation. And there's a whole lot of people uh, that I could thank for that. They gave me clear instructions. Uh, and those clear instructions were very general when it came to meditation. A lot of the books I've read about meditation don't say you go from point A to point B. Meditation is a very personal thing I have found out. There are some guidelines 
some helpful tools to use with meditation. But what is it really about my meditation? For me, at the very beginning, when I sat down and tried to meditate, two minutes seemed like two hours. I was crawling up a wall, and all I could hear was me. And if I wasn't listening to me, I would hear the dog barking in the backyard or the siren going down the block. It was all over the place. And I says, I'm failing. And I learned in doing, I'm succeeding. It's in not doing that I'm falling short. In doing, I succeed. And I would start with two minutes of meditation, and I would sit there. And then I would increase. And I was just trying to get still. And little by slowly, I got still. <clears throat> I've been able to do meditation now. Our book talks about we've developed a manner of living, which demands rigorous honesty. Back in how it works. In step 10, they talk about developing this manner of living. And I forget the exact words. This becomes, or is it a way of life? It becomes how I live today. It isn't a, an occasional thing. Well, you know what? Maybe today I'll meditate. It's what I do. It's what I move to do. My meditations, uh, for the most part, um, come after prayer in the morning, and I don't worship my, again, my methodology in the morning. Um, I do what God moves me to do. There's times where I'll read three or four books in the morning, and then do my prayer meditation. There's times where I don't read anything, and then do my prayer meditation. Currently, I'm working with a book called The Four Agreements. I'm working with another uh, uh, page that I read every morning from something called The Upper Room. Um, great information for me. I've been able to take some of those thoughts and practices into meditation and just sit with them. Just be. I don't have to do anything. Just be. I took the third step promises on page 63 into meditation for about a month straight and just sat with it. You know, I have a new employer that was going to provide me what I need if I kept close to him and performed his work well. You know, a promise and a warning. And I would sit with that in meditation. And just meditate on those words. I had no idea where they were going to take me. That was God's job, but I was showing up. And in doing, I succeed. And there were some events that happened from that, which were pretty neat. I've had, I, you know, I've had some experiences with meditation that I've never shared either. Um, uh, my current sponsor says, when you have something, don't always talk it away right away. I've had some experiences uh, a handful of years ago when I was living in Brooklyn meditation that I never shared. Um, a oneness with the God I was praying to for a long time. Then when I came out of meditation, I was wondering if it was just a dream or not. But I went over to a spot on the floor that I thought what had appeared before me just to see if this was real or not. But I can say for me, for me, from the bottom of my heart, these things have happened to me and have moved me to a place of maybe to definitely. I know what I'm praying to. That my God is listening to me. There was a time in my life where I thought God would just, you know, kind of wish me away because of what I had done and what I was doing. But I've been convinced over and over again through some of these experiences of, of, of what's going on. Some of the things I've learned in this current uh, uh, time through the work is not to define or comprehend my God. Too many things have happened to me for, for me to even be arrogant enough to think, well, I, I can comprehend and define my God. Too many things have happened to me with prayer meditation, working with others. So I just let it, let it unfold. If I'm clear, I can hear. I can't stress that enough. When I'm writing inventory and discussing with someone and doing my 11-step practice, I'm wide open and I can hear my God talking to me. That intuitive voice, the intuitiveness they talk about, that quiet voice, that sixth sense they talk about in our 11-step. If I'm blocked, I may think I'm listening to God, but I'm not. Or I bypass it completely. But in discipline, there's freedom. And part of that freedom is me hearing my God. My prayers are, consist of a few different prayers in the morning. Our Lord's Prayer. Um, I do my third and seventh step prayer. A few other prayers that I've gotten close to. And I sit. I, I was sponsoring a guy. Uh, he says he prays in the shower. I said, well, that's nice. Um, but I'm not going to tell you how to pray. But shouldn't you be a willing student? And kind of humble yourself to your maker and maybe hit your knees and pray. And uh, he was very reluctant to do that. And then he did it. And the impact was great on him. He was moved to a different place than just kind of this casual prayer to his God. I mean, God couldn't, what if he was sought to keep me sober and free? I'm going to treat that with some dignity and respect because that's how I get treated by him. The very least I can do is that. I remember when I first started praying, um, I wasn't even sure if God was out there. 
There was a time in the hallway um, that I reached out to God, if he's even listening, to save me from this. There was a time in the rehab that happened to me. When I was getting sober in the beginning, you know, I, I would hit my knees and, and just wonder what's going on. Um, today, there's, it, I've been moved. My conception of God has changed from where I, where, where I was when I got here in 1988 to where I am now. It's the same God I grew up with. You know, that my mom would take me to services on Sunday morning. It's the same God I grew up with, but a completely different conception. This God is not punishing. This God is not judging. That's the God I grew up with. This God is a lot different. When I studied my my big book, um, it was up to me when I was reading and going through this work for the first time. He says, they made a mistake in here. They put night first and morning second. They should have put morning first and then night second. That's how it goes, right? And um, what I have found out is <clears throat> if I don't clear up my day, I will carry in today into tomorrow morning. And it's about putting pen to paper and doing a nightly review, giving thanks. I sit quiet meditation at night, see what corrective measures should be taken. What could I have done better? And I turn to God for that stuff, and I get free or whatever is left over. So when I get up in the morning, chances are I'm not wearing yesterday. And I, I many times in here in Alcoholics Anonymous, I have walked around with yesterday all over me today. And it's not very pleasant for anyone to be around me when it's like that. I don't mean I'm such a troublemaker. I'm just blocked. I am not in the moment. When you come to me for help or you want to just talk to me and go to lunch, I am not there. I'm consumed with self. My 11th step has allowed me to clean up my day at the end of the day. I was talking about meditation earlier. I had, I, I, when my mom passed away, it was one of the most um, hurtful things that ever happened to me. And I've had... Um, some really neat experiences with her. One was profound. It, it changed my life forever. In visiting my mom in a meditation. I remember when I was using, I would make these bargains to God. Um, if you're even out there, you know, make my mom show up. And I would beg God, I just want to hold this woman once more. And I'll stop all of this. I'll put the drink down. I'll put the other stuff away. You know, I'll stop all of this. Just make this woman show up for me one time. And that didn't happen. And about eight or nine years into uh, um, um, in Alcoholics Anonymous sober, uh, going through this work, I, I go into meditation like I would any other morning, and I had an experience that was profound. My mom appears to me with my higher power in a meditation. I was lighting candles for this woman <clears throat> from very, very early on in sobriety, counting days. I was moved to go to church, not mass all the time, but I was going to church. <clears throat> and lighting candles for her and is still sick and suffering in and out of rooms. Why? I don't know. But that's what I was moved to do. I now know it was my God moving me to do that. But I would light these two candles and, 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 and make a prayer. And uh, eight or nine years later, I had this experience. And in this meditation, my mom points to these lights. And I thought they were uh, lights of a, like, they look like a Manhattan skyline at night. And she pointed to both directions, off to the left and off to the right. And it was all these lights, these hundreds of lights. and um, her and my God were made one, and they, and they walked off, and I came out of a meditation. I was very much confused, and I, I rang up my sponsor to share this experience. I had no clue what was happening. And um, being a good teacher and awake, he reminded me of me lighting candles for my mom for the last eight or nine years, and she let me know that she got them. Um, and I was convinced at that moment that my God, and this was a great freedom, that my God knows me, Pete Marinelli. My God knows me. So I was starting to learn about you with your God. Have that relationship you guys have. When this happened, I was convinced, as sure as I'm standing here tonight, that my God, who I was praying to, the one I grew up with, different conception, knew me. And heard my prayers. What a great freedom. We sit in prayer and meditation after living a life of for me, I was living in the street and dying of untreated alcoholism. I led a horrific life. And I come in here, and I turn to the same God that I had cursed many times, and he gives me this experience. If I had a God gave me what I deserved, I would not be sharing with you tonight. I would not have had any of those experiences, and God willing, the experiences I'll have down the road, as long as I follow directions and stay here. What I found, the more spiritual power I seek to embrace, the less self is in the way. 
the more self is in a way, the less spiritual power I can embrace. I mean, it's that simple. I seek, thank God. That's why I could, I probably never, God forbid, if I was to go pick up a drink, never survive. I never survive it. Maybe I would. I don't think so. But I'm very grateful for the bottom I hit getting in here in 1988. Because 14 years later, I've been moved to continue to do this work and seek and work with others. I feel blessed to be able to stand here tonight and share with you. It wasn't always this way. I went to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and hated every, I would hate everyone in this room. There's a part of me that wanted desperately what you guys had too. Never could pull it off though. This is some of what my God has done for me. I started working with this new sponsor and uh, he was taking me through some of this work. And um, that judge that screams at me, you're not worthy enough, you're not good enough, um, who you're fooling, he's lost a lot of energy. But he would show up sometimes. And there was a part of me that would say, you know what, he's right, you should listen to him. He's lost a lot of energy. I'm sitting in meditation and I, I ask God to show me where I'm missing. Why is this, this, this thing still here? And my God gave me very clear words and they were very subtle. Don't doubt. And I had to sit back and say, what does that mean? How many times do I use self to overcome an obstacle because I doubt my God? It was that simple. Since then, there's many times where here it comes. I remember the words that were given to me. Don't doubt. And I turn in in order to go out. I turn to my God. And I could be in this room full of people and still turn to my God. I could be driving on a highway and still turn to my God. Have you ever had this? <clears throat> you're driving on a highway, you're in a shopping store, you're watching TV, and you feel the presence of your God, and you know it. There's just something going on. It's one of the most profound things I've, I've been able to experience many times here. For no reason. I mean, I didn't say, okay, God, show up. You know. <laughs> I have said that. <laughs> Lots of times. Um, but it just happens. And you feel one with the Spirit. You know, walking hand in hand with the Spirit of the universe like our book talks about. These are great, great blessings that I've gotten. I know you guys have gotten. Talk about working with others in, in step 12, and um, one of the greatest promises our 12 steps read is having had a spiritual awakening. It doesn't say, in case you had one, <laughs> if you have one, you had it. Step 10 says, I've entered the world of the spirit. Step 12 tells me, having had this awakening, it tells me what I'm supposed to do with it. Remember, uh, next, uh, ne next uh, uh, to grow in understanding and effectiveness. I've entered the world of the Spirit. The old timers would tell me, either grown or you're going. What am I going to do with this, this experience that I've been given, based on my track record, I don't deserve, but a loving and caring God said, here. Time for you to get free. Having had a spiritual uh, uh, awakening, and a book talks about, in, in the back of the book, a spiritual appendix, spiritual experience and spiritual awakening. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. The educational variety, or what Bill had in Towns Hospital. But I will tell you this, when God shows up, God shows up. And whether it happens over time, when he shows up, you know about it. And if you have the, 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 what Bill had, you'll certainly know about it also. But God is not going to be subtle when he enters and, or he's awakened in us. That's been my experience. When God shows up, he shows up. What am I going to do about it? Do I kick back and say, well, I had my awakening when I was five years sober. I'm a 30-year in AA. What new experiences am I seeking to continue that? Because there are plenty to be had. My 12-step talks about <clears throat> working with others. And, uh, you know, one of the things I, I may sound kind of weird saying this, but our book talks about, in the very beginning, remember they are very ill. Um, many, many times I've had working with others that I wanted for them more than they wanted for them. Or they would balk, and they would question and find loopholes, try to find loopholes. And I would get just so worked up about it. And I was shown just these few words in a book. Remember, they were very ill. I mean, I wasn't exactly the brightest light when I walked in here. 
you know. Um, have I forgotten where I came from? And my job as a sponsor is to remember some of that stuff. And if you care to have what I got to offer and are willing to go to any lens, then I'll walk through fire with you also. But I can't do this work for you. If you don't care about your recovery, how can I? How can I help you? I may care about your recovery, but how can I help you if you're not willing to put pen to paper? And I just hope maybe, you know, you're not one of those people that got to go out and do it again, maybe come back or die. And that's the real deal, what happens to us. Um, I've had the privilege of working with many in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sometimes I teach in here as a sponsor. God asked me to teach, take someone through this work, show them the path, share my experience and hope with them. But I'm always a student, even when I'm teaching. And I hope to always be a student and continue to stay teachable. Because I learn sometimes from new people, hearing their experiences and remembering what it was like for me when I got here. Hearing what they're up against. Sitting down with someone <clears throat> and hearing them read, you know, do a fifth step and you're on the receiving end of a fifth step. And you see the look in their eye, they're scared to death. I know what that's like. I just went through this. 14 years sober and I'm sitting down <clears throat> and I'm like tight again. What are they going to think of me? I remember that when I'm working with others, not only here in the fifth step, but just working with others. The stuff that's going on inside of them. The great thing God gives us is the ability to take someone out of that cave, like Bill talked about Evie, and walk them out to freedom. I've been able to instruct people who are crackheads or suffer from other addictions and lovingly guide them to a place that can be helpful to them and not say, just keep coming back, you know, um, if you really want it, you'll get it, when they have no identification with another drunk. I've been able to do that. There was a time I couldn't. There was also a time I was one of those righteous people, you self-righteous people, who would ram this book down your throat. I've been one of those people who have watered it down. My motive, I want you to recover more than you want to recover. Through a lot of experience of doing this, for me a lot of experience, I've been moved to a place where I give it away the way I give it away and rely on God to do it. If you want what I have to offer and are willing to go to any lengths, I'll walk through fire with you. Working with others has been one of the many bright spots in my life, and I don't give that lip service. You see people, we see members come in here like we did, broken with nothing, take this message, embrace it, and sponsor other people. What a great thing to see. People who thought, like myself, I was hopeless beyond recall. A book talks about 100% hopeless apart from divine help. That was for me. They wrote that for me. That's how I felt. And yet you embrace me when I walk in the door and says, do this and you'll get free. You said welcome when I walked in the door. You didn't say, you're wearing the wrong clothes. You got the wrong hair. That I would have been really angry about. Um, <laughs> do you want to stop drinking? And you guys just extended your hand. And once again, it was that flimsy reed that proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. Our book gives us lots of ways to work with others. And I've taken them as guidelines. Good guidelines. But as you know, if you work with others, sometimes the message stays the same, but the delivery is sometimes a little different. Sometimes you've got to balk it, guys, and sometimes you can talk as calm as you can be. Sometimes with people, when they come in here in the condition I did with absolutely nothing, what seem the most difficult cases are often the easiest ones to work with because there's nothing left for them. There's nothing. You know, um, we always kid around that the guys get new sneakers and women get manicures and hairdos uh, as soon as they're sober. And sometimes I work with a guy and after like two months he's got new sneakers on him saying he's on the path maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but working with others is uh, certainly one of the bright spots. And um, I have found... Um, a balance of passing this message on. Um, I was told when I first started work with my sponsor, um, I asked him to, to, to help me, and uh, he said I had to go home and read the first portion of his big book. And he told me, I want you to read the preface to page 164. And on the second visit, it was I prepared to go to the 12 steps and then tell my story. Um, and I certainly was. He asked me, was I willing to go to any lengths to recover? And I certainly was. And we began this journey. And my sponsor would give me, <clears throat> and this is not in the book, but certain days to call him. I had to call him on certain days at a certain time. 
you know, you'll hear people say, well, I've been trying to get my sponsor for two weeks. I can't reach him. My sponsor eliminated, eliminated that right from the get-go. You know, Monday, Wednesday, and Saturdays, when I first started working with this guy a bunch of years ago, were my days to call him at 9 o'clock in the morning. And he was there. I pick up the phone, and he was there. There was a connection made. And we would do work on the phone. I would go to his house, and we would do work on the phone, and he'd, he'd tell me about this book and ask me questions. And little by slowly, things started to happen for me. They talk about in a step uh, practicing these principles in all, all our affairs, and now I know why they put inventory in to you know correct our mistakes and make amends because we fall. I fall short. But I said I don't know if it was last week, a couple of weeks ago. Um, walk with me and see if I live this life, or am, am I just talking about it? Go home to my family and ask them if I live this life, or do I just talk about it in Alcoholics Anonymous? Ask my boss if I just live this life. If I live this life, I just talk about it. I'm okay to tell you that today because I've been moved with all my mistakes that I make and I made plenty that this is no longer a theory. It has become my life. Um, I don't cop to the, to the saying, um, it's a bridge back to life. If that works for you, that's great. Uh, but this is my life. This allows me to go out and to be an employer, to be a husband, to be a son, to be a brother, to do things that God wants me to do. And I move through this life that way. When I was a longshoreman, it was really easy to get caught up in a lot of things that weren't too healthy for me as a recovered alcoholic. And I had to really turn around and say, what would God want me to do? Very simple question in practicing these principles in all my affairs, not just the affairs that are convenient for me. What would God want me to do? What would my God want me to do? And sometimes it's easily answered by, I, don't, I know he doesn't want me to do that. Sometimes, sometimes it's as simple as just being. Sometimes it's as simple as just turning in in order to go out. What would my God want me to do? <clears throat> I fall short of being a husband. I try to be a, a, a good mate to my wife, and, and I fall short. Um, this sounds kind of crazy, but like two years into marriage and a little bit of therapy and really working hard with these principles and a whole lot of prayer, I learned how to argue. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. We, we learn how to argue. But I grew up with ideas that no longer worked for me. And I was attached. I didn't realize how attached I was to certain ideas growing up in an Italian family and what a man's word means and how to have a relationship with a woman. That works for others. I found two years into marriage that no longer worked for me. What kind of principles am I taking home after I leave this meeting? Are they mine or are they what God wants me, what God want me to do in this situation? It took a lot of work, a lot of work, <clears throat> a lot of um, swallowing of pride and uh, confession of my shortcomings to my sponsor about some of the things I was, I was trying to be like in the house. And uh, in God's time and his power, um, doing a fairly good job with that, and I still fall short. Being an employer uh, on the waterfront, it was like, give me, and maybe I'll give back. Um, I work till 4 o'clock, but you better pay me till 10 tonight. Um, that was the type of ideas I grew up with. Um, I don't live like that with my current employer. In fact, after the experience I went through of being unemployed, I'm very, very grateful to have a career, to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and be self-supporting through my own contributions. This is a great thing. This work um, that we are given to do, um, if we if we seek it, has been the only way I've known how to get free and find this God. This fellowship is the greatest gift I'll ever receive in my life, Alcoholics Anonymous. Being with you guys the last four weeks, as I said when I opened this talk, is one of the bright spots of my life. Um, I brought something I was going to read that was given to me. Um, from the grapevine. Um, it's a really neat article. and can I, can I, um, It's called Flight Pattern. And when it was given to me, I was moved by it. And when I first looked at it, I says, oh, this is one of these, you know, hokey things they put in grapevine. You know, what does this mean? And uh, <clears throat> it, it, I, I'll share it. It's called Flight Pattern. It says, next fall, when you see geese heading south for the winter, flying along in a V formation, you might like to consider what science has discovered and why these geese fly this way. It has been learned that as each bird flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the bird immediately following. 
by flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds at least 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew on its own. People who share a common direction and sense of community can get where they are going quicker and easier because they are traveling on the uplift of one another. When a geese falls out of formation, it immediately feels the drag and resistance of trying to go it alone and quickly gets back into formation to take advantage of the uplifting power of the bird immediately in front. If we have as much sense as a goose, we will stay in formation with those who are headed the same way we are going. When the lead goose gets tired, it rotates back in the formation and another goose flies point. It pays to take turns doing hard jobs. Geese hung from behind to encourage those up front in order to keep up their speed. We too say something when we hung from behind. Finally, and I want you to get this, when a goose gets sick or is wounded by gunshots or falls out, two geese fall out of formation and follow it down to help and protect it. They stay with the ailing goose until either it is able to fly or until it dies. Then they launch out on their own with another formation to catch up with the group. If we have the simple sense of a goose, we will stand by each other like that. I have seen people over and over and over again sit with the sick and suffering walking in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and occasionally we lose, we lose some of us. We hear those stories many times. But what a great gift it is to be a part of this fellowship, to be able to sit down with someone who's sick and suffering and try to nurse them back to health. I've heard in Alcoholics Anonymous that God works through people. It is not only, pe it is not only people in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's people out there. And when we go out there, when we go to those families of drunks who come in here, you know what the family's like when you show up and the husband or the wife's on a drunk and they've made their first or second meeting. They're walking on thin ice. They're full of fear. They have no idea what, what's going to break next, what's going to happen. You go back to that house six months and that person is recovered and going through this work and part of the mainstream. It's a new house. We do God's work here. I feel blessed and privileged to be able to be a part of this. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the last four weeks. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.